Okay. Uh, I'm so glad to welcome you, Pamela Green, uh, the director and uh, producer of Be Natural, a film that I had the privilege of participating in when you were filming now a few years ago. And it's a wonderful opportunity, I think, to re-look at this film and for visitors to our exhibition, City of Cinema, to consider your film, Be Natural, as part of our programming here uh, for our exhibition, which runs uh, until July 10th. So I want to ask you a very simple question at first, which is what motivated you to make this film? Well, first of all, I just want to say, Vanessa, thank you uh, so much for including me. Uh, the exhibit is absolutely gorgeous. So to be part of it is a huge honor. And um, I'm just super excited to be here. Um, what made me do this? What makes anyone do things? I think it starts with um, curiosity and passion. Um, I had not gone to film school. I had been in the industry for a minute, film industry, film intelligent industry. Uh, and uh, I came across uh, a, a documentary on AMC from a while back about pioneering women in cinema. And uh, Alice Guy Blaché came up and uh, it wasn't that she was the first female director per se it was that she had her own studio she had accomplished all these things she was this this mogul uh, that I was just completely uh, blown away and then I guess the research began I wanted to know more so can I also ask you what's really interesting about your film is it's in a way there are two stories one is the story of Alice Guy Blaché and the other is the story of Pamela Green learning about Alice Guy Blaché. What made you decide that the film wouldn't just be what we'll call like a straight historical doc, that you would actually include your own journey in the film? It's a really good question. Um, I didn't want to be in the film, um, but I wanted the, the research to be a part of the film. Because if I did just a regular, um, I don't know, maybe regular is not the right way of labeling it, but a, a straightforward documentary without showing what it took to bring back this person, I don't think people would emotionally maybe connect to it as much. Although Alice coming on camera is amazing, but I think people needed to understand that this was going back in time, revisiting uh, scholarship that had been done before and, and finding new material, uh, you know, to validate her importance um, in cinema and that cinema was created by male and female and, and showing the proof. I wanted the respect from the academic world because I wanted um, students to learn about her in school. So I wanted to make sure that she was validated and and everything was covered. No stone was unturned, good, bad, and ugly. Let's put it out there, make sure that we get this story um, told correctly with new information because I don't think it had been done in the way that a detective from the outside world, I'm not an academic, so I think I've become one <laughs> uh, be because of this, but I think when you're doing research, and Vanessa, correct me if I'm wrong, you could only you only take on a sliver of, of somebody's life. I don't know if you necessarily can do the whole. It's 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 costly. Um, it takes a lot of years out, out of your life. It took me ten, and uh, I just said, you know what? Let's go after the whole pizza because I don't want just a slice of Alice. I want the whole pizza. So then, I know it's funny, pizza, but um, so, so people could uh, really understand her as a whole and that her legacy could live on longer uh, with all this new information and maybe get other people to want to find out more as well. That was a long one, sorry. <laughs> do, you, do you think that you are able to do this in part because she has this whole American side of her life? You know, she's a French woman, of course, but born there, well, born in, well, born in France, but her family at the time was, as you tell us, living in uh, in Chile. But 
Um, but did you think that perhaps the American side of it allowed you to pursue the research angle in a way that if it had all been in France, you wouldn't have been able to? And can you tell us a little bit about your belief that there were going to be people who were her descendants who had materials in their garage? Like, can you talk a little bit about that impulse? Uh, yes. So it's great that she had a, a two decade uh, career in, in two countries. Um, that was really helpful. Um, I'm the eternal optimist. Uh, I was like, if I find like a fingernail of something, I'm excited, but then it's like, okay, where's the rest? Um, I'm a detective by nature. And uh, if I didn't have the experience of cold calling in my day job and, and having the love for archival and finding things in attics and garages, et cetera, for my day job, all preparation for Be Natural. Um, maybe it would have been a little bit more difficult, but I definitely am, am lucky that in, the, in America, a lot of people did do work on, on uh, female filmmakers. You have Cecile Starr, you had you know, Maxine Haliff, you know, people that are in the film, and you just don't know what kind of papers they have, photos, you know, and, and if you don't, you know, check and follow the trail, um, then you're going to miss out. I think one of the other things, and I'll talk about France in a second too, is I'm a little bit of a lunatic <laughs> in my research. Um, I took her memoirs and I made an Excel file of every single thing that she said any, any person with an initial, any address, et cetera. And I went after every single thing to make sure, you know, I'm calling apartment buildings, finding out if, you know, there is any neighbors alive. Um, you get to a point where you're just so desperate to find something that you just have to keep going and you can't stop. It, it's, uh, it's, it's an addiction. And uh, <laughs> that's what it was. And you have to go there. You have to be in that place because you have people that are the rooting for you. It's like, yes, keep going. And then you have people that are saying, well, you're never going to find anything. It's a hundred years ago. So that finding like, you know, spoiler alerts, we found a lot of things in the film, including relatives that propelled me to keep going. When it came to France, it was actually really hard uh, with the institutions um, they did not want me to make this film, <laughs> especially not a woman making it and especially not an American. And I happen to live in France, so I speak French, but it's like, who is this person who's not an academic who thinks she's going to do this? So it wasn't just the work of having to uncover, it was having to prove myself along the way that I would be able to deliver. It, it was, um, it got dicey at times, you know? And what, you know, it's, first of all, I think one of the reasons I love this film is because there's a, it reminds me of a book by a woman named Eunice Lipton called Alias Olympia. And it's about the search for Manet's model, you know, the woman who uh, posed as Olympia. And Eunice Lipton recounts also her journey on tracking her down, on finding where she lived. And I think for all research in all, all domains, but I think especially for people who history is in a sense forgotten, but they're in plain, they're hiding in plain sight, in a way, um, that kind of dogged research is fundamental. And I have French people always say to me, well, Vanessa, you know, every time we close the door in your face, you seem to come in through the window. <laughs> so, you know, I, I like to use this film just to show students about what it means to do research and not giving up and baking the tape. I love the baking the tape. Yes. Moment. Yes. Uh, I spent a lot of time, you know, on, you know, transferring things from old technologies, uh, because, of course, this is going to be, in a way, a new problem of doing research, audiovisual research. But, you know, there was one little research dimension of the film that didn't really, uh, that was kind of passed over quickly, because it wasn't your story, but it's, I want to hear a little bit more about Joan Simon and why it is that Joan Simon knew about the archive in the first place 
in a, to get it to MoMA. Like that kind of just happens, but we don't hear the story or when that is. Or So could you tell a little bit about Joan and that part of the story? It's an amazing story. Uh, Joan uh, is, is a Shiro and uh, she's known about Alice for a long time. And, you know, both of her daughters grew up uh, learning about Alice, which is fantastic. Um, I got a hold of Joan because uh, there was a book uh, that was published by Yale uh, about Alice, uh, essays about Alice Key Boche that connected with um, uh, the Whitney, which was uh, an exhibition of Alice's work, uh, which was very unusual that uh, she curated uh, a French woman's work at the Whitney at the time. And uh, we started talking and uh, she lived in Paris at the time. And uh, I would always forget about the time change because I was so excited to talk to her, poor thing. And uh, her husband would answer, <laughs> it's like, you know, five o'clock in the morning. Um, but we immediately connected over our love for detective work. And through that, I discovered that she had found out about Alice and Crete. She did this, uh, was, you know, obsessed about, uh, no, she found out about it in an article. Then she went to Crete to find out more. I think there were very few of Alice's films at the time and um, maybe under 40. And she decided that she wanted the Whitney to, to curate, um, uh, you know, to do the show of Alice Guy Blachet, which again, this is, it's not my story, but it is my story because I'm, you know, on her shoulders in a way, because she was able to get funders like American Express to pay to transfer the films. So they would be available. So it went from 40 to 90. And for people to see this exhibition at uh, the Whitney, it was very powerful uh, in 2009. But again, it's for a very specific uh, group in the US, in New York. People might be coming from all over the world. You know, be natural, we, it, everything is like um, a jumping point to keep moving things forward. So when I started talking to her, I said, you know what, what I wanna do is I wanna take, you know, the knowledge that you have and I want to make this film completely accessible. And I want everybody in the whole world in different languages, I don't care if you're in Japan, Russia, whatever, to know about her. So she's like, okay, well, uh, this is, you know, we should get started. And I said, okay, well, you know, you know, all the bodies are buried. Because <laughs> she had dealt with, you know, a lot of people in academia, et cetera. And she says, the first thing you need to do is you need to go to MoMA. So during this time, I believe Allison McMahon, uh, before that had, uh, was writing her book and they had a chance to go meet with Alice's uh, daughter-in-law who was still alive uh, in New Jersey, I believe, um, or maybe Pennsylvania, I don't remember, um, Roberta. Uh, and uh, uh, she had Alice's papers and um, Joan, uh, brokered uh, a deal with MoMA to get Roberta to get the papers out because they were going to be damaged, you know, the weather, they weren't being taken care of, she was already older. And that was a gift um, for me, treasure trove. Um, because once I was able to go through those papers, looking at it through uh, a different lens, um, who would even think about trying to find people in an address book from 1950s. That would be me, you know, going mm -hmm. on Ancestry.com, trying to link the stuff, trying to find somebody. So it was definitely an amazing uh, place to look at letters and uh, find new material by looking and rereading and rereading and rereading. So it wasn't just that Joan had done the exhibit and, and made more films available, transferable, music, et cetera, she also was able to get the documents in a safe place for me to pass on the baton to me to, to continue. And eventually I just, I dragged her in to be natural. 
because <laughs> I was like, okay, well, we need to, you know, continue on working on, on this together because it's a massive project and there's so many points of view and you want to make sure you get all the different aspects. So, um, and she moved to Los Angeles as I was making it. So that was nice. <laughs> That made it easier. Well, that's, that's, you know, I was very interested about that kind of dimension of the story. And I do think that, you know, one of the strengths of this film is um, how generous you are with all of your interlocutors, that there's not a kind of territoriality. And in a way, of course, scholars, you know, spend their time carving out what it is that they learn and know, and it becomes theirs in a way. And so it's very hard fought uh, to get many times. And so you kind of become territorial. But one of the wonderful things about the film is all of the voices that you get on screen with different perspectives and different expertise. And I think that really enriches uh, your film. But I want to kind of take a, a little bit of a different angle because, you know, you have a feminist, I think, perspective on, on Alice and her life and her experiences. And I want to push up against it a little bit by saying, uh, you know, Melies, as we know, was forgotten. And right, there's a famous story of his being, you know, selling the toys in the train station uh, or candy and toys, and then kind of being rediscovered in the late uh, or in the early 1930s. And really, there's no equivalent to your film about Ferdinand Zeka, for example, or even Louis Feuillard. So there's a way in which I wonder, would you entertain the idea that it's not just that Ariski was kind of forgotten because she was a woman, although I think her difficulties and challenges, especially the relationship with her husband, uh, I think is very much a story of, of being a woman. But what did you learn about kind of filmmaking in, in early cinema and whether there really were people like directors? Is there such a thing as a film director, you know, in the first you know, 15 years of the movies. What's your position on that? So it's an interesting question. Um, I think early cinema was not really taken seriously, you know, it was experimental, you know. I talk about it in the film too. It's like, now you got the TikTok videos. <laughs> So when I was doing the film, it was like, you know, the Instagram and, you know, you do all these different things and you're not thinking necessarily about the maker. However, TikTok video makers are getting representation and they're becoming makers. So it, at first it's experimental and then it's, it's taken seriously. Um, these were promotional videos to promote the company's equipment, you know, how best to get people to get come into the store and to buy the cameras. Alice took it further. It's like how to entertain them further on top of it because she liked the media. I think if she was a man, I think her, her career would still be interesting as well. I think because she was a woman and the subjects that she picked and all that stuff, it makes it more interesting. I think Louis Fiat and Zeka deserve their own stories told. Absolutely. This, I mean, beautiful stuff. Um, but I think it, it has to do with the period where these people just got, you know, swallowed up and buried because nobody wanted to look at silent cinema again. It was only rediscovered uh, later, thanks to a lot of people. And, and, you know, I just wanted to mention one more thing about that. The reason why I showed the process wasn't about me and, and the people con uh, connecting emotionally to the story uh, only. It was to show what it takes in these archives and all these he unsung heroes that are doing amazing things uh, to restore, preserve, and, and keep this medium alive. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that people saw behind the curtain um, uh, of these amazing archivist, for example. But I think there's so much more work to uh, be done in early cinema. Um, maybe this film can inspire other people to look up Zeka and, and Fiat and, um, you know, Emil Cole, 
you know, he's the father of animation. He could use an amazing, it was great to see some of that stuff at the, at the, uh, you know, City of Cinema exhibit. So there's so many untold stories from the period that need to be told. It's uh, unfinished painting of the era that we need to go in and fill in people's contributions. So we can get a true picture for sure. So what, what do you think by, you know, I thought that the film, I rewatched it, of course, in preparation for this discussion. And you did do a very good job in the film of both talking about her biography and what we'll call film production, but you, you actually do try to think about the films she made and what they looked like or what stories they told. And if you had to say, well, by excavating the work and attributing it more to Aliski, what we're able to know, which we didn't know before is X, what would it be for you? What's the kind of two or three things about her films themselves that now that we looked at them, we understand something about early cinema that maybe uh, we didn't before. I think the most important thing about Alice, uh, of course you can't show everything in the film and you know, people have like complained, why is there just snippets? Because some of these films might not be available to see as a whole. So I want to make sure that you see as much as possible. I think, uh, what you get from Alice is she is one of the pioneers in the grammar of cinema, storytelling. It starts with storytelling. I think she was a storyteller and she had this, found this device and she just kept pushing the medium that was, you know, on training wheels and, you know, try to whip the training wheels off and just keep going and push how much can I do with this medium? How much can I push it within the constraints, you know, of where she was working and the technology at the time? But for her, it's story. Melies is a magician, you know, as I say, and, and then the film, Alice is a storyteller. That was the main thing for me. Can, you know, one of the things about, especially seeing the American, the Solax films, where she goes, you know, to cowboys, um, and cavalry, which I thought was really interesting is when you compare her to Melies, you know, Melies is a magician. Melies is also um, really uh, very technologically sophisticated and he, it's very contrived. He's a genius of manipulating the space of the studio and really, you know, starting studios. And, you know, you had Brian Jacobson talk about the Gaumont studios too, which exist. But what I would say about the Guy films, and that's your, maybe we could go back to your title a little bit about Be Natural. I thought the scene where you show with uh, the late, unfortunately, Ronon Lac, um, that you know, where it was filmed in the neighborhood uh, by the Gaumont studio, you know, where, here's the street and here's where it was shot. And you kind of retake that, that comes up again in, in Jersey. And uh, you know, when they when they moved to, to New Jersey, especially, that maybe her interest in story meant that she didn't care that she basically had to film outdoors and in kind of any place. Uh, although she did work with very good set decorators, which you point out too. But you know, could you talk a little bit about the be natural idea? Yes. Because stories are fictional, and yet be natural. You know, you make a point of it. It's the name of your movie. So could you kind of talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, Sure. So, so basically, uh, when she was starting out, she had like leftover Lumiere sets. They didn't have the budget for all these set decorators. You know, when you're starting out on YouTube again, you know, you're making an indie video and you're glad if somebody gives you their house to shoot in. <laughs> so I think the streets, et cetera, was to give it more production value, but also realism. She, she knew that her audience was uh, a, a specific audience, day-to-day -day people, and probably wanted to see themselves on the screen to relate. And um, and Solex was one of the state-of-the-art studios um, in, in America. She took everything she learned from Gaumont and uh, working there and took it further. But I do think by looking at her films, you really connect not to all of them, because, you know, it's, it's a learning process. You, she got better as she went, as she, you know, kept making films. 
you connect emotionally to the to the characters and be natural. The reason why I called it that was she had a sign in her studio that said be natural. But for me personally, they really had a naturalistic um, uh, feeling. And I did connect to the characters. Some, you know, again, some of them could be overacted, et cetera. But as she, you know, uh, was working on her craft and got better and better, they became much more um, emotional. If you look at Ocean Waif or The Empress, I mean, those are beautiful films. And um, you really get into the story and it's, it's beautifully shot. And it's, it's really about the characters. I think she, she dabbled in the visual effects. She used them when she thought she needed them. But for her, it's like, I want people to connect emotionally. So, well, you know, in um, in our uh, Salle du Cinéma, we have a twenty minute kind of compilation reel at the end of our exhibition, and one thing we do is show three different versions of the Passion of Christ, and we have hers last. Uh, we show the same scene, which is the Last Supper, and it's very interesting because, of course, that was the film that nearly you know got her fired, as it were. I mean, she was over budget; they shut her down. And they're very elaborate sets as there always are on kind of what we'll call epic uh, films. And in that instance, actually, she does, uh, The Last Supper is really interesting because it's not only extremely contrived, but it's very sophisticated because while you're at The Last Supper and Judas is you know, about to kind of betray Jesus, you see a scene behind like where they're all sitting of him basically on the cross and resurrecting, which no one else does. And it was a kind of an interesting projection forward and a use of dissolves and, um, but also really thinking about, and there's an example where I would say the, the technology or the effect is meant to be sophisticated in terms of storytelling. It's not just, I can make your head pop off. It right. was really a kind of an emotional, uh, you know, moment of prefiguring, which is what the denunciation of Jesus, you know, eventually leads to. So it's a kind of technology in the service of the story. And it's really the best of the three, which is why kind of we did it uh, at the end. And also her uh, crucifixion scene is is excellent. I was personally more in favor of showing crucifixion scenes because that's the super dramatic part of any Passion of the Christ. But we went for the Last Supper, but her crucifixion is also great. It's gorier. He falls more. It's very, um, it's very dramatic, I would say. Mm -hmm. So another thing I thought about your, your film is, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I felt there were more of the Solax films than there are of the earlier Gaumont films, and I wondered whether that had to do with the Library of Congress, uh, uh, in particular, kind of having probably those films in a way that they were maybe earlier known and better preserved, but I don't know if that's true. I'm just guessing. So what was, is that is that right? And were they easier for you to get, or is that just oh my, my God. impression? Nothing about this project was easy. <laughs> it's like the climbing the Great Wall of China, every day. I mean, it's just, uh, it was just nonstop. Um, what happens with these films, once they get restored, they're no longer, uh, you know, they're out of, they're out of, cop they're copyright protected. Um, so then it becomes more expensive. Then the copies. So Library of Congress might have one film, but it's not tinted. Well, okay. This archive out of the 62 archives has the tinted, but there's no music. So, <laughs> so you know, I didn't show that much. Uh, I had a composer do music for the whole film, but there was always something happening and finding out which version was the best one. One was transferred from 16 millimeter, one was 35 millimeter. I think the girl with the armchair, it was, uh, it's at UCLA, at the Academy, but then Serge, Bongberg has it. And, you know, we had to have a whole specific file to figure out what's what. It was very, 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 very expensive. So then I had to go look through a database, you know, asking Dino at USC, talking to Serge, who was fantastic in, in helping can, us. Can you just say who Serge Bromberg is? Uh, Serge yeah. Bromberg is, uh, he's amazing. <laughs> he... He's a curator and, and he was, he restores 
films and he's a he's a nitrate detective <laughs> film detective because he goes to find uh films and i think he's responsible for putting uh, Melier's trip to the moon back together if i'm incorrect he has a lot of alice's films he's a huge huge uh cinephile and um knows everything about early cinema um uh and he has a he has an operation called lobster films he, he does an amazing restoration. He does, a lot of companies hire him to do restorations and preservations of films. But so what I was saying is that he's also a distributor and he's, you know, this. Yes. he has lots of films and he comp compiles these and also resells them um, on yes. uh, DVD. And I think one of the really interesting things about early film is on the one hand, there's this kind of recovery project and then there is the strange thing about everybody trying to monetize something that's essentially out of copyright and should be. Yes. And so what allows it to be monetized, as you say, is the work of restoration or the work of making these copies available. But it really is kind of, um, it, it's, you know, the, that wouldn't be true of the Library of Congress. I think the Library of Congress uh, has a very nominal fee for things yes. um, for see everything for free i don't know what they do about reproducing but it's Richard has commissions of the people that own it originally and in fact it's because of our, our work on the film and the, and our funders that paid for getting the films off the shelves whether if it's at the bfi or at the i museum etc so they could be seen for the first time because the stuff was sitting there or only shown in Pordenone, for example, etc., the Empress took two years, I think, to a 1917 film with Doris Kenyon at the Cinematheque Francaise. It took two years to convince them because they said that the inner titles weren't complete, so it didn't make sense for it to be available. Um, and it's because of our work that the film is, these films are available in those formats now. Kino Loeber released the DVD, and that's because of Be Natural's work. You know, without us and having all the funders paid to transfer all those things, they would not have been able to uh, put those films on there. Yeah, and that is, I mean, those are, that, that is kind of, you know, a great, um, it, it's great for, for those who are interested in early film, whether they're students or whether they're just kind of fans of early film, to start to relook at these, um, these, uh, films that they don't really know. And so I guess I was, I want to push you back again to, so she told stories. If you had to say, well, she ran a studio, <laughs> right? She ran a studio. She so, hired people um, that went on to be very successful and she built her own studio. Um, there's a lot of things that she had a rotten husband. She had a rotten husband, but, right? um, I mean, I think for me, when I first watched her interview, I mean, if we're going to go back to talk about her importance, um, there was a documentary done before. It's called The Lost Garden. And um, footage of her was cut off. And I fixed it in my film and had every single uh, Dutch subtitle removed off her neck because it bugged me. This was a human being that had accomplished a lot in 20 years that most people in the film business today would never even accomplish. She wrote as well. She's an amazing writer. Um, and uh, I felt that this person was, was robbed in a way. I felt that it was very male dominated and this voice needed to exist alongside the men. And, and, and comparing you know, people's work, et cetera, I mean, even with the Academy Awards, how can we say this movie is better than that movie? It's, it's a very strange thing. I think uh, as an individual, it's a, it's a person that, that saw the technology that was an amazing storyteller and through writing. And, and she went ahead and, and took it further, but also created jobs, you know, built an empire, you know, was somebody that be cons can be considered like an Ava of uh, Ava DuVernay. 
of, of today. So to me, with all the, the different aspects of how difficult it is being a woman at the time. So I just think that she's interesting for, for so many reasons, you know, not- but don't you all, I don't mean to cut you off, but don't sure. you also think that part of, and your, your film alludes to this, that in a way, because film was not yet big business, you know, they let women do it too. You know, in yes. other words, that and and you show that that there were kind of lots of women directors because no one cared. Yes. This was garbage. This was like, you know, we need you to work and we need to make some movies and go, you know, make some story. And she's like, okay, I'll put the babies in the cabbage things. And you know, then you write that she kind of turns it into something more. And as the industry evolves, she not only contributes to it, but of course her ambitions and her abilities um, are stronger. But the reason they let women do it is because nobody cared about it. It was not an admirable profession. It was not a respectable enterprise. It was not the theater. The theater is a much more important milieu, I would say, for storytelling uh, at the time. So it really, and you know, you were making things that were disposable objects. And so sure, they let, they, they let women do that, I think, um, which is also a kind of an interesting, um, an interesting you know, revisionism. In other words, that we find women because no one cared. And then when everyone cares about the movies, then we have Griffith and you know, Chaplin and, and we get rid of them or, and that's why Mary Pickford is very interesting too, right? Because she was you know, a producer and a star, and you start to see also the emergence of the performers, the people in front of the camera uh, in the phase really after, I would say, you know, Aviski's um, period. So I guess I just wanna ask you um, one more question, which is, are you continuing to pursue your interest in early French cinema? What are you up to now? Uh, when you're not, uh, you know, doing what you do to, to make a living, which I guess is what's on display at the very beginning of the film, right? Where we see the wonderful kind of animated, very kind of 3D, you know, uh, special effects, which I guess is what you actually do uh, for films as far as I remember. But are, so are you still doing that or are you working on other documentaries? Like what has this experience um, led to for you as a, as a filmmaker yourself? Um, well, I became a filmmaker by making uh, uh, Be Natural. I, I learned a lot. I had no idea what I was doing. I thought I would find the tape. Once I found the tape, I'm like, oh, that's a movie. That's it. But I'm annoying in a way that I always want more. Like, I'll talk to Cosima, who's one of the producers of the film. We're working on another project. And she's like, oh, I just found this piece of information. I was like, wait, what about this piece? And it's like, just be happy that we found this piece, but I can't, I'm, I get obsessed. So I am going to be doing um, a biopic about Alice Kibalaget. And uh, I have, you know, other, other projects. I don't think they're going to be in scope as, they're going to be big in scope, but they're not going to be big in scope as far as 10 years, because I'm not getting, um, not getting any younger. Uh, but they're all, um, detective uh detective oriented in some fashion whether it's the research or the actual characters um are detectives uh, we do have a project that we're trying to get made about the female detectives in the pinkerton um era and um uh, we're excited about that and um the rest i can't talk about yet but uh my day job is not visual effects, actually. It's, uh, I do opening credits uh, for films, but I also do internal graphics and editorial sequences to help with uh, storytelling issues. Um, but uh, yeah, it's anything, any project that I'm working on involves um, research, um, but I, I, I don't know if I will be visiting um, early cinema unless it's going to be for, for Alice's biopic, which then we can put in Zeka and Fiad and Emil Cole, um, just not in a, in a documentary um, setting. Documentaries are very, very, very taxing. And that's why I wanted to show that process as well. 
because it takes a lot to bring somebody back in a way. Uh, I, I don't think she was fully lost, but to make her accessible to an audience who doesn't understand something that happened a hundred years ago. Um, yeah, I'm still well, tired. <laughs> well, that, so that, I mean, it sounds great. And I think it, we don't have enough even fictional films uh, about the history of the movies. And I think, you know, they, they're, the Chaplin ones have been fairly interesting. I think it's a rich subject. I think, frankly, the way you tell the story in the documentary, you could really do it as a series. Let me make a pitch for, you know, as a series for something like, you know, Netflix or whatever, because there are so many angles um, and they're now you know interested in costume dramas maybe HBO HBO you're out there listening uh, you know it's the Gilded Age has also yes. done very well um, and is interesting as a kind of costume drama that's again dramatizing you know pseudo fictional and uh, and realistic characters and I certainly think and there was of course as you probably know the Bazar de la Charité there's a French version mm -hmm. of a kind of melodrama multi-part series about the period in France. And it's about the you know, fact that a lot of rich women and children burned up in an early fire uh, in 1897. So, yeah. Yeah, it, of the movies. And so that series kind of does in some ways like Moulin Rouge describe, the many Moulin Rouges describe this period, which is always a favorite, I think, and we hope for, um, for all people, but especially Americans who can appreciate in some ways. And that's why, you know, we like to say that, you know, if Be Natural is your kind of tag, ours is, you know, before Hollywood Paris. Right. And so I think for those of us really interested in the history of the movies, you know, you have to begin at the beginning and that's with people like Alice Guy, Blaché, and places like Paris, which, you know, gave birth uh, to this industry. So I wanna thank you for your movie, for your work, for your respect for knowledge and research and your generosity as a filmmaker, because it's very apparent, uh, not only your love of research, but really your generosity as a filmmaker is very apparent in the documentary. And I think that's what's engaging about it too. Uh, you really bring a lot of people into the discussion. You're as uh, respectful and fun with the relatives as you are with the talking heads. And I think it really works. And I also think your capacity as an interviewer to bring out, you know, professors can be very bad on tape, unfortunately, you know, as this may well prove, but I think you do a great job. Sorry, of, could you say that again? <laughs> Um, of animating, that was my watch. Um, yeah. You do a great job of animating the professors also and your interlocutors. And I think that also makes it a gripping documentary. So I wanna thank you for the work. I think the film will uh, be something that people certainly in early film will always wanna show. And I think that's not easy to accomplish. So I really congratulate you and I'm glad our exhibition uh, has given us an opportunity to show it again to a, a, a new audience potentially. Well, coming from you, Vanessa, that's a big deal because making this film, that was one of the things that I wanted to make sure I, want, I wanted, you know, I kept saying Vanessa Schwartz. I want to make sure that when she sees this, that, you know, she knows that I did my homework. <laughs> there you go. And okay. if people have not seen the show, Please go see it because it's absolutely stunning and and fun uh, to see from all aspects between the the paintings and the gadgets and how everything together um, the films they inspire one another and um, it's just beautiful. So thank you for having me. <laughs>